Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode three of Beva Broadcasts. Today, joining our director of program development, Sam Ambrose, we welcome Mrs. Brianna Engelbert Vogt. Brianna is currently the assistant director of bands at Franklin High School in Tennessee, as well as our very own euphonium faculty at Fred Brass. Today, Brianna and Sam will be discussing the necessities of balancing a multifaceted musical career. They delve into a range of subjects about what Brianna and other directors are going through right now, splitting time between high school band, their performance chops, and life balance during a pandemic. All right, good afternoon and welcome everybody to episode three of our July Beva broadcasts. Uh, my name is Sam Ambrose. I'm going to be hosting this session. I'm one of the directors of both the Fredericksburg Brass and Tidewater Brass Festivals and also a tuba faculty at both. And joining us today, our featured artist and faculty member, our euphonium faculty, Miss Brianna Engelbert Vogt. Hey, Sam. Sam is a rock star. For any of y'all who don't know Sam, he's, he's being modest. He's an incredible teacher in person. Oh, and he's an okay tuba player, I guess. Uh, yeah, I'm all right. I practiced a little bit today. <laughs> uh, Brianna, in case you all don't, aside from being our euphonium faculty, she's also the assistant band director at Franklin High School in Franklin, Tennessee. Uh, she's also an accompli- accomplished euphonium player. She solos and plays in a brass band, correct? Out in the yes, Tennessee area. The S- Southern Star Symphonic Brass Band. Awesome. Yeah. And didn't you just recently solo with them as well? Yes, before COVID. Uh, of course. I think <laughs> I, <laughs> I, I think not many of us were soloing before COVID, and now we are all going solo. <laughs> um, so, so true. Yeah, so today, uh, Brianna is going to talk to us about uh, being a teacher, being a performer, being both of those things and what that relates into our life. And without further ado, I'm going to pass it off to you. Yeah, thanks for thanks for doing this. And uh, anyone who's joining us, thank you uh, for, for joining us live and checking all this out. So I am going to be talking about kind of the teachers of performer, more performers of teacher, um, but also how I kind of balance it all as a, a wife to an incredible husband and the mother to an awesome eight-month-old baby girl named uh, named Charlotte. We call her Charlie for short. So let's jump on in, if you don't mind throwing up that slide, Sam. You got it. So the first thing that I want to talk about is um, kind of to, to teach or not to teach. That is the question that a lot of us face um, as we're going to school. We know that we have a passion for music and for sharing that music with people. And obviously, we have had to have um, incredible educators in our lives. So at least I found myself torn between those two options, right? Between having to... um, Do you mind refreshing that too, Sam? I don't know if this is the most recent. Uh, Yeah. Do you see that at all? We should have that second slide up. Yeah. Yeah. I added a few more things to it. If you don't mind refreshing, I think it might work. Yeah, yeah, you got that. Um, so for me, it was kind of like, what what do I do? I, I know that I want to impact people's lives. Do I want to do that mainly as a performer or mainly as an educator? And I, I was torn for a really, really long time. Um, I went to a great high school, Marian Catholic High School, had two uh, or multiple um, great educators. My aunt taught me um, everything I know before that. Uh, she's Kristen Engelbert. She's a bass trombone um, player and performer, and she taught me euphonium lessons. So I had a, a great uh, background, great uh, high school career, and then I went into college. So I started off as an undergrad at Tennessee Tech University, and oh, that looks perfect. Thank you. And I started with an education degree, um, knowing that I wanted to teach at some point, um, but I also went to a really great school for euphonium, studying with R. Winston Morris, because I knew I wanted to perform too. Mm -hmm. And then I went off and I did a few things and I went to grad school and I went to grad school for performance because I was adamant that I really, really, really wanted to be a euphonium player in a premier DC band right, which is a very difficult gig to get, but I was like, I totally want to do it. Let's go, let's go. And in my practicing there, I I was, uh, of course, very dedicated and kind of like knows the grindstone, just practice all the time, get those excerpts done, and something was missing, Um, and I couldn't quite figure out what it was until I got the gig as the associate instructor of brass techniques at Indiana University, and I did that, and I started teaching all these future educators um, what I know about brass and brass pedagogy. And um, we also I co-taught the lab band there. So it was like, it was helping all of these future educators learn how to 
teach brass in particular, and then just how to impact other young people. And that was the most fun I had had in years. And I was like, oh my gosh, man, this is it. This is what's missing. And I realized it immediately. And so I added on a master's degree in music education as well. And then straight out of um, grad school, my husband and I both got uh, teaching jobs down in Tennessee. And then we had a baby and here we are. Um, so here's a spoiler alert. I think Sam can attest to this as well uh, as a public educator and as a performer in that you, no matter what career path you choose, you are going to teach. And if, even if you choose to go out and do the performance thing, you're going to teach. And hopefully as a teacher, you're going to perform, whether it's your individual instrument, whether it's jumping on a podium and performing by teaching in front of your class. So I just wanted to lay out a, a couple things, kind of real talk here. So um, performer and a teacher, you're going to impact people just in different ways. So performer, it's, an obvi it's obviously an audience, kind of of your choice, depending on who shows up. Um, but as a teacher, you get to choose to impact young people. Or if you're teaching private lessons, you can impact, you know, kindergarten age, pre-K age, all the way up to uh, retired, uh, retired folks. I will say as a teacher, there are some um, additional pluses that you can throw in here <laughs> and that there is security. Oh my gosh, in this world of COVID-19, performers unfortunately don't have that. Um, even performers at uh, steady gigs, like orchestral performers, a lot of orchestras are, are folding right now. Um, now, granted, nobody could really see this coming at the scale that it has come um, and it impacted us all. But as a teacher, we do have that added, added security. And now as a mother who's had to take maternity leave um, to have FMLA and know that you will have a secure job when you come back from recovering from mm -hmm. childbirth, that yeah. is a huge thing, let alone health insurance, my gosh. Um, stability, having a home base, um, that is something that I really wanted and was a key factor in choosing to be um, a music educator versus going out and, and, and living that gig life. On the flip side, as a performer, you get to travel all the time. Uh, I mean, there's kind of some insecurity in that, but there's also this really fun thing of going out there and, oh my gosh, the panelists that we have uh, later on uh, throughout this month say all about that. Teaching does require certification. Um, and so that is why I highly, highly, highly suggest getting a music education degree, not a music performance degree. As somebody who has both, I can tell you that I have used my music ed degree a thousand times more than my performance degree, which is zero times. <laughs> have I shown somebody <laughs> my performance degree and said, hire me? Um, so highly suggest music ed degree. Yeah, that, um, that doesn't even work at McDonald's, unfortunately. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> as much as we wish man that'd be awesome um anyway you do have to remain active in in both fields um as a teacher i think it's very important that you are playing your instrument at all times you're going out you have to do professional development anyways um so why not even, even if you choose not to play and you're going to conduct you have to remain active in whatever you're doing and obviously you have to have those performance shops as a teacher but as a uh, as a performer as well professionalism and kindness you're going to have those in, in both of these fields um, uh, I will say that uh, out of everybody I've met you get to a certain level sure there are some like phenoms that are just incredible on their instrument that some people like you'll never be able to attain maybe that that amount of greatness but you reach that professional level where almost everybody can play on that same playing field you can put a piece of music down in front of them they're going to be able to play it you can put like a score on a on a stand in front of a band or an orchestra, and almost most people could conduct it and teach it. What matters most to, to me and to I think many people who are going to get hired is how you act outside of that setting. So how kind you are. Are you a bridge? Are you are you a bridge builder? Or are you going to tear down those bridges? Um, so that's just something to keep in the back of your mind and. We move on to the next one, unless you had something on that, Sam. Yeah, I will. I will have to say, um, I would definitely take uh, Brianna's advice on kindness. She's probably one of the most kind people I've Gosh. gotten to show. And whether you do teach full time, professionally, perform, whatever, your kindness is going to go a long way throughout your entire life. And of, I think if it's going to give you nothing but professional benefits as well, it might behoove you to try that every once in a while. Ooh, and look at those vocabulary words, too. Behoove. I dig it. And so this is kind of my personal story time on to teach or not to teach. Um, and I really had to take a hard look at myself and say, was I, when I wanted to um, 
play euphonium in the in the DC premier band was that a societal expectation or was that something that I really 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 wanted to do was that truly my passion or was I just doing it kind of for kudos or kind of that name recognition and so I studied um, with somebody who's really renowned in the field of the low brass world at one point I'm not gonna say who this particular person was and I asked him I said how are you such an incredible player how are you so well known how is your name out there so often and he said well easy um, I've put my instrument as my number one. Everyone else in my life knows that my instrument always comes first. It is my number one. And I was like, at first I was like, okay, cool. And then I kind of meditated a bit and um, I, I took a step back and I journaled and I was traveling at the time. Um, and I realized that I really, euphonium was not my number one. I found myself kind of missing and aching for my number one, and that is uh, Austin, who's now my husband. And at that point, uh, when I was on that trip, that's when I was like, okay, I know my number one. I know what path I want to take. Um, and so the, the, the teaching thing, the stability that I mentioned before, having a home base, um, that played a huge um, part of the career path that I've chosen and that now I don't really care about what society thinks. I care about what I want to do and what I want to do for my family. So that was a huge factor as well as positively influencing others. So because of my history and my backstory, um, uh, I'll just say that my high school band directors, uh, Greg Bim and Bobby Lambert completely changed my life and set me down a safe and uh, a really the right path. And if I didn't have them, they helped me figure out what I wanted to do in life. I mean, I'm still kind of figuring it out, but they helped to send me down the right path. And um, so because of them, I wanted to be a high school band director. So I found that missing piece, which was educating others, influencing others. I found my number one, and I used my background um, to kind of influence where I am now. Very cool. And for those of you who don't know uh, Greg Bim, legendary band director out at Marion Catholic High School. Um, how many decades is he into teaching now? Four or five? Oh, I think it's the fifth decade. It's yeah, gotta be. Absolutely. Just incredible, not, incredible achievements. Yeah. Not to put an age on you or anything there, Mr. Bim, <laughs> <laughs> if you're watching or listening to this at any point. Yeah. Uh, yeah, he's, he's phenomenal. And one of the, like you say, I'm a kind person, but I mean, he is just, he's where I learned all of that from. And Bobby Lambert too is incredible in his own rights. He's at uh, Wando high school now. Um, so performer as a teacher. So this is kind of, um, I, I still perform as a teacher to keep my chops up. Yeah. Because it's something that I like doing. Yes. It's passion. It's my, how my husband and I met through playing euphonium. So we play in Southern stars symphonic brass band together. Like that's kind of like our, our time, kind of our date nights is when we get to perform and practice together. Um, but also because it helps me to teach my students and it helps me to relate to them. Um, first of all, I will say that it tells me, uh, what to do or what not to do as a conductor. Um, <laughs> uh, it's, it's always good to check in because I'm, I may know or think I know what's best for the kids, but when I experience playing euphonium and like the back row or the middle row of a band, it's, com it's completely different. And it's a great reminder, um, if nothing else, than to just let the kids play sometimes <laughs> to get as many reps as possible. Um. Of course, networking for your students. Oh my gosh, this has been one of the biggest things ever. And I'm so grateful that I'm at Fredericksburg Brass Institute and I'm now teaching with cadets so that I can network for my students and say, hey, you want to do this in life? Oh, you want to go into music industry? You want to learn about recording or music business or law relating to music? Or maybe you want to be a teacher or a performer. Um, these are the people that you can go to. And I can hook them up and I'll be like, oh my gosh, you got to meet the Sam Ambrose guys. You've got to. Um, and I will say, kind of a real talk too, is that um, imposter syndrome, that has helped me a lot. Oh my gosh, just having to feel that and experience it. And I've experienced it um, in my teaching chops as well as my performing chops. I mean, even at Fred Brass and Tidewater, like these guys are some, and gals, um, these people are some of the best people and best performers and educators in the world. And sometimes I feel like an imposter kind of like, you know, why am I here? Why are you having me on Facebook live? What is this? And I think it's important to realize that our students are having to go through that as well. Mm -hmm. um, 
And so one thing that's helped me out a lot, and it was um, advice that I received from a friend, Chris, and he said, I was telling him about this, and I was like, man, I'm going specifically to Fred Brass, and I was like, man, I'm going to this, and I, I don't feel like I really quite belong there. And he's like, well, why don't you just embrace it? Like, what do you mean? He's like, what's the worst that could happen? What if, you know, you aren't quite the best person or best performer there? What else, What do you bring to the table that's different than everybody else? And that really helped me so much so that I don't know if you remember this, Sam, but I, I bought a little like black notebook last summer. Yeah, yeah. And I was like, hey, can you all just sign this just so I like kind of have your autograph? And then you all kind of used it as a yearbook, which I wasn't expecting. And you wrote all these really kind and really sweet notes and it just made me feel so good and warm and fuzzy inside. Um, so I think that's something that we need to remind ourselves as educators is that our kids are going through a difficult time, not even mentioning COVID right now. I mean, they're hormonal teenagers. They're going through a lot of change um, and they're trying to figure out what they want to do in life. So I think it's important to remember that we all have a little bit of ego and that we have to check it at the door a bit. Yeah, I'm really glad you brought up uh, that whole a bit about imposter syndrome. I think that really does go beyond like self-confidence or even a self-inflicted uh, doubt among yourself. And, you know, going back to what you're talking about kindness and how, and how you interact with your peers, you mm-hmm. know, imposter syndrome really to me is understanding or maybe a lack of understanding of the skill set that you might have, whether you are a student or a teacher or a professional performer and not really being able to employ that skill set because of the mentality that you're engaging in. Um, mm, do, you, yeah. do, do you mind like maybe elaborating a little bit on that more? Like a t- maybe a time where you felt like that showed up in your teaching or playing or, or how you being a teacher or the player role has conflicted and added to that imposter syndrome. Yeah. I mean, absolutely. I'll, I'll take it back to this book. Uh, uh, written by, I think it's Daniel Coyles, maybe, I forget his last name, and it's called The Culture Code. And I have David Adelit to, to thank for that, for and, and Jacob Campos for kind of pushing me to to read it. And in the preface, it talks about this, this one study that was done, um, and it was just all these people who were trying to stack a marshmallow on top of spaghetti noodles, um, like uncooked spaghetti noodles. And there are all these businessmen who came out uh, and it participated in the study with all these advanced degrees, and of course, they have a ton of knowledge. You think that they would do incredibly well, um, but they were so concerned with their roles and their own ego and how they fit in within the group that it took a, a very long time to accomplish their goal. And kind of like this imposter syndrome, right? Everyone, I'm sure that there were some people in there who had that a little bit and didn't want to speak out or were afraid to speak out and impacted their performance. Whereas uh, kindergartners participated in the same exact study. And I think it was a group of six of them or so. And they got it done within a few minutes uh, compared to these businessmen. And so uh, I think it just shows that when you kind of release these inhibitions and you don't care about specific roles within what you're doing, you let go of your ego. You don't think... You, you don't let the, the thoughts go into your mind of why am I here, but instead you just mindfully focus on what you're doing, then you can achieve, achieve uh, things at a much greater rate and uh, much higher quality. So specifically in my own playing, oh my gosh, I don't know if I can think of a specific story, Sam, where this has happened because it's happened so many times. Um, but one um, was, uh, I'll, I'll just say um, this past year, I, I'm new at Franklin High School. Um, it, it was a brand new year and while I was pregnant and then I had my baby and then I came back to school and then COVID happened again. And I think I was so concerned with my role within the program because I've never been an assistant band director before that I let that get in the way of my teaching to a certain extent. And I really regretted it when it got to the end of the year and we didn't have the kids back. And I was kind of reflecting on all that that could have been and all of the times where I let my own ego um, kind of get in the way. Mm. of thinking, you know, do my coworkers like me? Do they think I'm doing a good job? Instead of just saying, here's what I think we should do. Let's do it. Let's just do a good job. Um, That's impacted me as a performer too. And I mean, it's led to stage fright, to performance anxiety. And I think the one thing that's helped me the most is to practice mindfulness and to just focus on, on what I'm doing, just focus on the music at hand, focus on my full breaths and to 
um, let these thoughts pass through my mind with, without judgment. If I frack a note, I'm not going to judge myself. I'm not going to weigh on that. I'm just going to keep going fearlessly kind of into the next thing. Awesome. Yeah. On that uh, subject, we got a, a question uh, from Marcus Grant, a wonderful performer, hey. player, and educator, friend of the festivals. Marcus. Yes, asking, Marcus. How common as well do you guys believe imposter syndrome shows up for both professionals and students? Oh, I think it's incredibly common. Mm -hmm. I think almost everybody deals with it. I don't know. I don't think there's a single person that I've met who hasn't felt uh, imposter syndrome at some point. I don't know. What do you think? I, I, I totally agree. I think, I think it's obviously very different for most people. And I think that as we transition from the student part of our lives to the performer or the teacher part of our lives, there's this kind of thought that, okay, I've got through college. I've got my degree. Uh, I am now good enough to do whatever it is that this degree qualifies me for. And I think that notion almost sets up this idea of imposter syndrome that you don't, and it's kind of like what you were saying earlier, you know, you don't need this degree to validate you as an educator mm -hmm. or validate you as a performer. And so I, I think it is very common. And I think uh, for professionals, they learn it as students and it, it can either grow or it can adapt to something to help them positively. So I, I think it is extremely common as well. Yeah. Yeah. And I can speak just for the students that I have taught. Um, I'm going on, this will now be my fourth year. If you count the COVID world as a full year, <laughs> this will be my fourth year of, of public school teaching. And um, there hasn't been a single year that I've taught that I haven't met a student with some sort of performance uh, anxiety issue. That's really just presented itself uh, through or imposter syndrome that's present, presented itself through performance anxiety, whether it's like sweating backstage or they get really nervous or, um, or choked up. And some people have even cried or even broken down right before a concert. So um, I'm not saying that we have to, to, to hug everyone all the time. Um, that's another thing, by the way, <laughs> we should not uh, uh, fully give students hugs all the time. That's another topic for another thing. But um, we I'm not saying that we should call everybody all the time, but we do need to equip our students with tools to practice mindfulness and to practice uh, living in the moment because they're going to experience it in their professional lives too, even if they don't go into music or into education. Uh, that imposter syndrome can, can creep up at some point. Um, the only thing uh, else that I have on this particular slide is modeling. So, of course, as a performer as a teacher or a teacher as a performer, that's like the number one easy uh, thing to think about. Uh, I think that most people think about is, is being able to play for your students. And I found it much more effective uh, to just play the style that I want instead of telling them the style that I want. And I'm lucky enough that I'm, I'm young enough now. I still have my performance chops and I'm able to do that for the most part. And honestly, the kids just listen more. They get tired of hearing my voice. <laughs> and, and listening is what it's all about sometimes. Mm -hmm. Most times. <laughs> Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. Um, and moving on to the next slide, too, I, I, uh, I wanted to share some pictures um, a little bit. So speaking of imposter syndrome, oh, my gosh, that, that picture on the bottom left, um, that was kind of the, the full ensemble. But I was part of, uh, I guess, quote, unquote, like an all-star ensemble for Dan Parentoni, uh, who my husband and I both study with at IU um, for his uh, teaching anniversary. I think it was his 50th year of teaching. And um, so I was asked to be a part of an all-star group. And I'm like, what? Why am I in an all-star group? Total imposter syndrome story there. I mean, I was playing like with Demandre and like all these military band guys. And it was incredible. And gals. There are gals, girls there too. Um, maybe not binary people. I don't know. But I'm playing with all these professional people. Um, and I didn't feel like I belonged. And I just kind of uh, was able to kind of pull myself out of that and just enjoy the moment and have a lot of fun. And that middle picture there too is of uh, Demandre Thurman and Mr. P. Um, and it was just a really fun experience. Um, and that's a picture of us uh, all at Fred Brass last year, <laughs> all crammed into an elevator. And I put that in there to kind of tell that story that we already talked about where I felt a little bit of imposter syndrome there, but also to show that we're all, we're all feeling that way. We're all in this together. And it's the moments like that, like being stuck in an elevator together that, <laughs> that really make it all worth it. And then these other pictures are from our students this year that I've shared with parent permission. Um, that's Jacob Campos, uh, the band director at Franklin and myself, uh, along with um, some of our students 
Um, and we, what we did is during this COVID time, obviously graduation um, was, was pushed back. So we actually have a live graduation, socially distanced, um, coming up here pretty soon. Um, but we wanted to go out and uh, Jacob and I are both relatively young. He's a great clarinetist in his own right, went to uh, DePaul and uh, is an incredible musician. And so we wanted to go out and surprise some of our seniors uh, by playing Pomp and Circumstance uh, for them from a distance. That is so, so we just, cool. Yeah, and that's a way as a performer and as a teacher that we were both able to combine um, our abilities to to give back in a meaningful way to our students. So we couldn't afford to like get them all yard signs or get them a ton of gifts, but we could afford to spend some time going out and sharing music with them. And that I think made a really big impact. Um, I don't know if it did on them, but it did on us. We were crying. I love that. That's, that's fantastic. Um, I'm going to leave this uh, slide up really quick also because I just absolutely love that picture of Kenneth at the bottom. <laughs> yes. And uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read another question from our trumpet faculty member, Dr. Derek Ganong. And he's asking, what hey, has been Derek. your experience with students going to college from high school? and the pressure mm -hmm. that they feel from their family, teachers, and peers to choose a degree path, or how prevalent is the attitude of, quote, the name of the degree is the name of the career? Ooh, I like that. <laughs> That's great verbiage. That's why you have a doctorate. Oh, my yeah. gosh, Derek. He's not a doctor for no reason. Uh, <laughs> I will say that there is an immense amount of pressure. I've worked in uh, – that, that our students are facing um, – I've worked in two very different scenarios. So one school that is a little bit like um, uh, the community is a little bit more blue collar and another school where the community is much more um, kind of uh, white collar and then kind of a mix socioeconomically of, of both of those at, at both of these schools or at each of these schools. And I'll say there's an immense amount of pressure either way. I'll say that um, the first job that I had at Riverdale High School, um, there was um, a little bit more, um, I'll say, openness towards degrees, uh, pers pursuing things that weren't necessarily degrees. So like going to trade school um, and, and not going into debt, going to college. And now at Franklin High School, almost all of our students, I think it's around 99% uh, percent or a little bit higher than that, um, go on to get a college degree. And I, I have found that there is a little bit of an expectation from their parents, um, not necessarily to, to go to college, but to do things in their lives that are better than what their parents got to experience. And as a mother now, I can say that absolutely. I hope that my daughter is able to go on and, and do better and greater things than I am. And um, speaking as a parent now, it's, it's, it's hard to not want to push her away from music. And I know that might sound really, really weird, um, but I, I want to expose her to music. I mean, she's played or pushed down my vowels on euphonium. She's playing piano. She's banging on bongos and she loves it. At the same time, I, I kind of, I know the pitfalls of music. I know that it's a really difficult field. I know that educators are not given nearly enough credit or enough salary for the work that we do. I know that performers are not giving enough salary for the work that they do. And there's not nearly enough stability that there should be in uh, performance careers. And so I, I, I don't necessarily want to push her away from something, but I do want to educate her on all these different career paths that she could go down to still have a happy life and pursue her passions, um, yet have stability and have health insurance and be respected by the world. Um, and I noticed that all of our parents kind of have that same, uh, those same thoughts for their students as well, as well as the teachers. That's uh, I don't great. know if that quite answered your question, Derek. I, I hope it did. Cause I absolutely love that answer. Um, this may, I don't know if this is an unfair question or perhaps it, may not really matter at this point, but do you feel like your transition into motherhood has, uh, I think it's certainly shaped those views, but do you think it's changed those views at all? Do you feel, do you kind of feel like you've held those values uh, even before you became a parent? I like to think that I've always held those <laughs> values first, um, but I, I, I can't say that I honestly have. I think that I'm still a young band director. I mean, I'm 28 and I'm still kind of fresh out of school, just going into my fourth year of teaching and all that. But 
um, I think even before then, my first and second year of teaching in particular, I was incredibly young. Uh, Mike Amick can attest to that at Riverdale High School and that I was kind of like gung-ho, like, yeah, let's do it, like all the time, give 100%. Um, of course, we always said, you know, family comes first. Um, if there's something that's going on with your family life, you need to be there, please go and do that. I've always thought that, but um, now that I have a daughter, now that I've transitioned into motherhood, I think that that is always what's at the forefront of my mind. I've always thought that before, but now I wouldn't say my values have changed, but they've uh, gotten, they've become much stronger. And that family absolutely comes first. And actually, if you can go down, um, well, it's a slide further on, and I was going to talk about it. I think it's slide 10. Um, but what if there's too much cake? And we'll go back to the other, other slides later. Um, and this is just talking a little bit about life balance. And there's one story that I'd love to share, and it was while I was student teaching um, at Tennessee Tech. And I had just gotten back. I missed a lot of school because I was um, in Europe working with Commodore's Drum and Bugle Corps, marching with them, and um, studying euphonium a little bit. And my grandpa was really, really ill. My grandpa, Big John, he was awesome. And um, we all knew that, that he was dying. He was on his deathbed. He was in hospice care. Um, but I still went on this trip. It was, I think, a little over a month long. Um, and we weren't sure when he was going to pass. And he ended up passing away the night before um, my flight back home. And that was tough, just being away from him and not being there for that. It was also um, tough that I didn't get to go to his funeral because when I got back home, or his services, because when I got back home, I immediately had to go back into school and back into student teaching. And the school specifically said it was, I think, the dean of education at the time. I don't think he's the dean there anymore. Um, he said that you've missed too much. You have to be here. I don't care if your grandpa, you know, passed away. I think he thought maybe I was making it up. And I didn't get to be there for him or for my family members who had to go through that experience. And that is... One, uh, I think I have two major regrets in life, and that was one of them, is that I wasn't able to be there. And in hindsight, I should have just said, ah, screw it, I'm going anyway. It's like, <laughs> I'm driving up there. My mentor teacher would have covered for me. Um, but instead, I followed the rules a little bit too much there. And um, that, I, I think, was one of the times in my life that, that shaped these values, to think that in, in this kind of, uh, it's kind of a pyramid in my mind, uh, like my Maslow's hierarchy of needs almost, and that family has to come first relationships, I think, um, come closely uh, second right after that, almost, you know, hand in hand in tandem. Um, relationships with family, with friends, and also with students. That's really mm -hmm. what matters most. And then music comes after that. Like teaching the notes, you know, teaching the ink, that comes after family and after relationships. Yes. Um, so, yeah, having a daughter hasn't necessarily changed my values, I don't think, but it has given me a little bit more perspective. And it has strengthened those values a ton. Awesome. All right, let's let's hop back here, shall we? We got some videos here. Yes. Oh my gosh, you don't have to actually play them. Um, <laughs> but these are just videos, and maybe we, we can share the slides later, or you can kind of just look up my name on YouTube, and you can see these links. And these are mid-state excerpts, so um, they might it, it might be called all district in other states, but in Tennessee, we have um, Tennessee mid-state, uh, like the middle of the state, the east uh, uh, all, or east state, and then west uh, Tennessee. So that's how we kind of divide. Um, it's like the, the precursor honor bands to all state bands. And so um, this was, I think, last year, the year before that, that I recorded these, and these are um, just for the 7th and 8th graders, and then 9th and 10th, and then 11th and 12th graders. And so I just kind of recorded videos of me playing the excerpts, and then me talking a little bit, walking people through how to play them. Not only is this for my students, um, because typically these um, auditions happen in rotations, so really you only have to make them, like, twice, maybe three times, and then you're done, and you can always share them with your students and say, hey, please watch this video. This is how we would teach it. But it also gives people uh, this resource who maybe cannot afford to have private lessons, or maybe their band director isn't a euphonium teacher, um, or isn't a clarinetist, uh, whatever instrument you play. I highly suggest that if you have the chops to play through some of this music, you just play it, and you put it out there. Yeah, and I, I, uh, to add to that, I, I think your students pretty much always appreciate when you perform to them, especially when you're, you're trying to show them something that a goal they're trying to attain a style, whatever that is. Um, 
And the simple fact that clearly you've had to put a fair amount of work into creating all these videos. So all of your students seeing how much work you're willing to put in to show them and guide them through this uh, process of their achievements and, and, and their learning, I think is uh, very valuable and noble and also just very kind to see if we can keep using that word. <laughs> well, thank you. I will say that it also gives me insights uh, as a teacher that I would not have realized if I wasn't playing them, like alternate fingerings to use, when to mm-hmm. articulate instead of using a natural lip slur, um, and then whether or not it's appropriate for students to play. Like, my gosh, I do that with the cadets book too. Uh, if I can't play through the book, then, <laughs> you know, it, something needs to change. Something needs to be rewritten, uh, mm-hmm. which that has not really been the case. Uh, but. I think it's always wise to say that whatever we ask of our students, we should always do that. So whether it's uh, picking up a piece of garbage, you can probably hear Charlie in the background. She's having fun with Austin. But, um, whether it's picking up a piece of trash as you walk past it and throwing it away um, or practicing 15 minutes every day, even just that little bit, if you ask it, uh, if we're asking that of our students, we should be doing that as well. Absolutely. So yeah, I want to talk a little bit about this is having your cake and eating it too. So everyone's always said, you can't do it. And I'm like, no, I really want to. I want to play and I want to teach. I want both. Dang it. Um, so two things that have really helped me with that are discipline and motivation. And you can ask anybody. I'm not always the most disciplined person. I really have to force myself to do it. One quote that was told to me when I marched drum corps and it keeps coming back is the pain of discipline now or the pain of regret later. Uh, The choice is always yours. And I'll freely admit that there have been gigs that I've played or pieces that I've conducted where during the performance or immediately after the performance, it was like, oh man, I wish I had 30 more minutes, 10 more minutes, either rehearsing the band or practicing myself so that I could make it better. Um, I think that's part of what we do kind of as perfectionists in the music field. Um, But if I know that I've done everything that I can and I've been, if I had, if I've had a disciplined regiment, then it makes me feel a little bit better about that imposter syndrome too. So schedule, schedule, schedule. I use Google calendar. I have it for everything. I have multiple calendars. Like I have a practice schedule in there. I've got a school uh, schedule. I've got um, a a home schedule so I can figure out like childcare stuff and figure out when Austin and I are going to, he's a band director as well. So figure out when our concerts are aligning, when we can um, watch Charlie and stuff. So Uh, whatever calendar you use, highly recommend that you schedule everything (laughs) because at least me, especially with all these Zoom meetings, I forget sometimes if it's not in there, if my phone doesn't remind me of it, then I'll probably miss it. Um, Accountability. So whether that's having an accountability partner, um, um, making like putting stuff online to say, hey, I'm going to do this practice challenge or hey, I'm going to throw down the gauntlet. Students, can you um, play this excerpt faster than I can or play it better than I can? I think Buddy Buddy was talking about that the other day. Um, That type of accountability not only helps the students, but helps you. Um, Like I said before, be the example. I mean, whenever you're leading any sort of, of person or people, group of people, you always want to show them exactly what you'd want to do. So like I said before, If I'm going to tell my kids to practice at least 15 minutes a day, then, oh, my gosh, I better be doing it, whether it's score study or reading about a composer or a piece of music or seeing if I can um, dive more into um, music written by people of color or performed by people of color. Like, I have to do so much better about that. I have to get my mind out there, and I have to um, always practice my craft. And then creativity is huge. So um, <laughs> I'll say at my, my first job I had, we uh, the, the band room was kind of cordoned off and the, all the doors were always locked. Kids couldn't get into like a, a back hallway or something into a practice room. And so during the winter times in Tennessee, not everyone's quite used to that cold. So we used that to our benefit in that we would only open up the band room um, half an hour early to those people who would come in to join a warm-up class or who would come into practice and so it was great to um see like all these students outside hauling outside the band room in their coats like let us in we want to practice and i don't know how much practicing they actually did more so to just come inside and play a little bit on their instruments but i'll take what i can get um try to give lessons if you if your um, county allows it or district allows it to have a private lesson program oh my gosh that is so 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 important 
Um, and then chamber coachings. Um, I think it's important when we start chamber ensembles to be a little bit more hands-on and then slowly back that off to give the, the, the students the freedom to run their own thing, um, but to, to jump in with a little bit of oversight here and there. You, you look like you had something real quick, Sam. Oh, no, I'm, I'm absolutely enjoying this. I, I struggle with a lot of these things that you're talking about <laughs> yeah. now, so I'm just taking my own notes as well. Hey, me too. I'm not saying by any means that I'm a master or an expert at these things. It's a work in progress. I think um, I will add, I, I really think it's great that you're talking about opening up the band room and giving a warm up class for your students and things like that. And just, you know, setting up that environment to where students want to uphold these values that you're talking about of having accountability, the organization, the creativity to want to collaborate with their peers and their teachers and things like that. And when, when they see their teachers, not only just opening the doors for that, but walking alongside them and they get to see you not only as a human being, but they get to see you Mm -hmm. as an artist who may be further down the path that they want to take or a teacher who may be inspiring them to find their own goals as well. But yeah, it all comes from that environment. Even if it is to get out of the cold a little bit, that's a really good excuse to cultivate a good good environment. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. We'll take advantage of that cold weather for sure. And I think that's a really important point too, Sam, that you mentioned is for our students to see us as human beings. I mean, I've fracked notes. I've cracked notes in front of the students. And I think the first time I did it, they were kind of like, what? (laughs) We mess up too. We mess up all the time. Oh my gosh. Um, we're not on some sort of uh, like a, a deity on some sort of pedestal. We're just human beings too, who I think you're absolutely right. Maybe just have a little bit more gray hairs than, than, our, than our students. That's all. <laughs> yeah, more um, than we'd like to admit. Oh my gosh, I have so many. I think the headphones are blocking them a little bit. Maybe the Zoom connection is. It's it's so much. Anyway, um, <laughs> routine. So I have Having a disciplined routine uh, is something that I struggle with, and I'm, I'm really, really trying on this. And, um, time, um, Pete Ellison is actually who I got this from, uh, doc, from Dr. Kenneth Johnson led me onto this, is that time is your most valuable resource. And if you think about it, this blew my mind. I was like, yes, you're absolutely right. And that once we use it, it's gone. We can never get it back. It's our most valuable resource. So you have to choose your time wisely, especially as a teacher and as a performer. It's incredibly difficult. So um, I, I, as a low brass player, I think, and you know this, Sam, too, we're, we're kind of lucky in that we don't have to necessarily warm up a whole lot in order to play some rep. Um, but I do think um, getting some fundamental routine in there is really, really important. I know Dr. Johnson is doing some warm-up routines this morning, uh, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Is that right? Yeah, absolutely. Thank, thanks for the plug. Yes. Uh, oh, yeah. The newly minted Dr. Kenneth Johnson is leading uh, warm-up classes, which will start to feature some guest artists as well in different practice routines. But yeah, um, absolutely setting up a routine. And on the teacher side of that as well, you know, if we set up this routine for ourselves as players, I'm going to buzz every day, do breathing exercises, long tone scales, whatever your routine is, is to set you up for your best playing, your best artistry. And we clearly want to do that with our students as well. So not only setting up a routine for your students, but going through a routine or them seeing you do your own routine and teaching them how to create a routine, I think is part of that. Uh, One of the biggest things you could really do in terms of teaching discipline because i think that you know goes beyond music goes beyond the arts and it's interdisciplinary oh absolutely and and um speaking back to to greg bim i mean one of my high school band directors is every time i saw him if we were at some sort of convention or something like all state he always had a score in front of his face i mean yeah he would chat with people and be friendly and very very kind but then he would put his, put his head in the book, put his head in the score. And to see him practicing that craft um, as, as a teacher, not necessarily as like a trumpet player all the time. That was incredible. And I mean, it still impacts me today. I mean, if I can spend five minutes to make coffee and drink coffee on my way to work, why can't I buzz for five minutes? You know, why can't I study a score or listen to new music for five minutes? Um, so I think it's a little bit a matter of, um, of priorities and also of just making the time for it. Absolutely. Um, So we talked a little bit about discipline. If you don't mind going to the next slide, the other part is finding your motivation. 
Um, so for me, as somebody who's not always great at sitting down and playing all the time and, and playing like my scales, I have to have motivators. And I know it's hard in this COVID-19 world, um, but a lot of people are posting these virtual ensembles. Check out the Fred Brass or Fred Brass and Tidewater ones that are out there. Um, I, I highly suggest that you find some sort of way to collaborate uh, with your peeps, um, whether even if you don't, you know, publish it out there for the whole world to see, if you can just share it amongst a group of friends, that is a high motivator. Um, so something that we've thought about, and I've, I've, actually, I've never actually been able to get all the moving pieces together, is uh, a faculty recital for your students. So uh, almost every single school that I know of has some sort of staff members or a private lesson program, even if it's you know uh, alumni who are coming in for free to help out. There are some people who are helping with a high school program. That's not just you or another director if you're lucky enough, enough to have two or three or four. But on a faculty recital, I mean, get everybody together, put them on the stage, have them play some fun stuff for the students or even goofy stuff for the students. And that is a high motivator to, to practice. My gosh, you don't wanna play for the students, that's it. Um, Gigs. Um, not only is this uh, a relentless tenacity, you have to follow through with people. I'll admit that as a band director now who receives a bunch of emails, it's really easy for me to miss something or for me to not reply to a text. Uh, Sam knows that. Like, uh, he, he texted me the other day like preparing for this and I found a drafted text that I meant to send him like three months ago and I just forgot to hit the send button. Um, so it helps to have this relentless tenacity where you're going to follow through and to not be afraid of people saying no to having you perform or to teach or to conduct their ensemble, but to, to follow up and say, hey, what do you think about this? And, uh, you know, I, I've got to tell you that if uh, we had somebody maybe applying to be a staff member, that would mean more. Somebody applying to be a drum major, even as a student, that would mean more to, to show that follow through, to show that integrity. You're going to be there. You're, you're passionate about it. Um, that means more almost than the, the performance itself. That shows what type of person you are. Um, in order to get gigs as a teacher, uh, specifically as a euphonium player, <laughs> Uh, after moving to a new area where I didn't know anyone really uh, much at all, um, part of it was name recognition. So one of the first things that I did is I contacted um, some local university guys who play trombone or tuba and euphonium. And I was like, hey, can I come play duets with you? Like, I, here's my background. I just got my master's degree here. I have my undergraduate degree here. I really, really want, really want to keep my chops up. Can we just play together? Like, can I, can I get some of your feedback? And, and, and part of that was a little bit of, I really am just curious and I want to meet everybody and I want to know the people who I can play my instrument with. Um, but part of that too, I found, uh, was name recognition and that they, they knew me, they saw me. Mm -hmm. And when something came up for euphonium or, or for like a brass ensemble or brass band, they're like, Oh, Hey, I just played with this chick. Like Brianna. Yeah. I recognize her. Um, so that and to say, create as much stuff as you can. A Music City Brass Ensemble is a brass ensemble in Nashville that was recently started um, by some folks uh, who actually pursued something outside of uh, tuba, outside of music. And now they have the means to create um, an ensemble and to support it. Um, so create as much as you can. And like we said earlier, always be kind. I think that's kind of turning <laughs> into the theme of this um, and that you never know where something's going to lead you. Marcus Grant, we just talked about him earlier. I mean, even getting the, the gig with Fred Brass, the only reason I think that you all knew to or, or, or reached out to me was because I think it was Marcus um, mentioned my name and Kenneth did as well. And Marcus, I mean, we, we weren't like really close friends or anything. I we just uh, met and we played in a few ensembles together and we smiled at each other and we said hi to each other. And that's sometimes all that it takes is to be kind. Um, not only because it's the right thing to do, but sometimes you get gigs from it. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, I want to go back to a point that you had just made about reaching out and trying to find those gigs. Um, how do you balance that with your public school job and the different hours after school activities, weekends, plus, you know, you've got your family to work about and all of your personal life. Because I think it's one thing if you are, let's say, an adjunct teacher, or perhaps you're part of maybe a marching band, or you teach percussion at several local schools, but it may not necessarily be that kind of full-time brick and mortar, I'm in at 7 a.m. out at 5 p.m. 
So how do you, as mm-hmm. a p- public school teacher and, and looking to be a performer, balance how much you're reaching out and like the, the different types of ensembles? Uh, obviously, your instrument affects the, the types of ensembles <laughs> you get to choose to reach out to. But Yeah, I just, I, that's a really great question, Sam. And I think it's, it's tough and I'm still figuring it out. Um, when I was first starting, it was easier um, because the at that band program, it wasn't as, uh, it was still a ton of work. I mean, any high school band program is a ton of hours, especially marching band season. You're working typically anywhere from, you know, 60 to 70 hour weeks, uh, which I don't think many people realize you almost live at the school. And so um, part of it is having people who are understanding. So Southern Star Symphonic Brass Band, uh, SSSBB, um, those cats, there are a lot of educators in there. And so the season is constructed around that. So our performances are a little bit lighter in the fall and then they pick up in the spring and they pick up a little bit in the summer. Um, so that helps um, for other people uh, and, and other ensembles. It is tough because once you turn down somebody once, once you say, Oh, I can't do this for whatever various reason. I mean, even if it's, you know, they, they just offered it to you and you say, sorry, I can't do it. Then they're not likely to come back to you again, unless you've already built up a relationship with them. Um, so I've had that happen before too. Now, especially that I have a daughter, um, that I've had to turn down, um, a, a gig here or two, uh, a gig here, a gig there, which in the phoneme world does not come by very often. So, um, but it goes back, I think to those values and saying that family is first relationships are, 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 are next. And then music is after that. Um, and so as, as long as I still have some sort of outlet to play and, to perform and to get these gigs, even if it's in like a Music City Brass Ensemble, that doesn't pay, but it's a it's a brass choir with other people who you can network with and 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 a, and a performance outlet, so you can get yourself out there. Then it's worth it. Um, I will say that uh, my calendar fills up really really quickly between band and performance and like the mob life and the wife life. Um, so if if anyone wants to schedule me for anything, it has to be months in advance. Otherwise, there's just no way. Um, that anything can happen and and you're right I mean the public school life it's it's tough sometimes you're there as early as six or sooner than that if you've got you know a field trip or a competition to go out to and then there are times where I wouldn't get home during March man season until like two or three in the morning <laughs> you know or later than that or it's an overnight trip and you don't get home until two or three days later um, but typically like our rehearsal days coming up in the fall I'll be there at 6 a.m. 6 30 and then I'm not going to get home until like 11 or 11:30 at night, um, and so I, I'm still trying to figure it out and figure out what that balance is, and you know maybe it means leaving for two hours here to put my daughter to sleep and then coming back to rehearsal. <laughs> you know, it's it's something though that I'm trying to to figure out, but I know that my values are in place, um, and I know that um, I have the right perspective, and so for me that comes first. Absolutely. And that will, I'm sure, guide you to all of your successes. We got some more pictures here. Oh, yeah. So this was a little bit, these are just some um, pictures recently within like the last uh, five years. And it's going back to kind of always being, be kind because these, this is the stuff that I remember. Yeah, the recordings, sure. Um, those are awesome to listen to and they always kind of get your blood pumping. Um, placements, no, I don't care about those. Medals, trophies, no. Those do not matter to me, but it's this, it's the people uh, that matter. So um, some of these, I think only two of these gigs were paid. Um, and these were, what, five different gigs that I was at. So one in the far left, um, was the Calumet Ridge Jazz Ensemble. That was actually a trombone gig, uh, believe it or not, playing with my my aunt and on the far right, and then Chris, and then Haley, who's a great uh, trombonist uh, as well. Chris is too. Uh, and that was uh, kind of in the region. Um, that was kind of like a gig back home after Tuba Christmas while visiting, just to connect and play with people. The gig in the top center is from a recording project that my uh, awesome um, past professor, Arwin Morris. Um, did and he asked me to come back and play while I was still um, a teacher. So that was a thing where he's like, "Hey, I need another euphonium player. Can you come back?" Yeah, sure, no problem. On the far right, that's Matt Crossley, tuba player, and we were just uh, hanging out at MTSU. They hosted that's Middle Tennessee State University. They hosted a tuba euphonium day, and um, the tuba euphonium and trombone professor there, uh, Chris Combest and David Lauke, asked us to come in and play in a quartet. 
and Crossley too is a, is a high school band director. So that was cool to have some two teachers and two professionals in that. And then that's a tuba Christmas. Those are tuba Santas in Bloomington, Indiana with Mr. P in the center. And then that's from Southern Stars Symphonic Brass Band um, that shakes an ensemble taking a picture, a goofy picture beforehand. So all that to say, it's all about community. What we do is about having fun for the most part. Well, it certainly looks like you're having fun in all these photos. Yeah, I'm also that type of person who, like, uh, you go on a vacation, and they take, like, like I take, like, 50 photos, and then I show them all to you and have, like, a two-minute story to each photo. <laughs> That's what I felt that last slide was like. Um, so we already talked about this one a bit, Was uh, but what if there's too much cake? Uh, and the, the advice I have there is to just take it one bite at a time. You know, take it one day at a time, and as long as you have your priorities straight, then you'll do the right thing. That's right. And one bite at a time, just like me a couple days ago, you can pound through an entire half of an ice cream cake. No problem. Yes. Well, yeah, was that of, for your birthday? A lot of problems on the other end. Yeah. Ab- yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yes. And happy belated birthday to Sam. He rocks. Thanks. I'm so glad that you got half a half an ice cream cake. Yeah. Sadly, I did not eat the other half. <laughs> oh, I love it. So I did want to mention too, and we don't spend too much time on this. I know we're almost at that hour, um, but band, I wanted to, to shout out to any current um, music educators who are out there or maybe people who are about ready to go into the field is that currently the Franklin uh, High School Band is back. We've had in-person rehearsals. Uh, we started on June 1st and uh, we had a week of, of rehearsals and then we had a, a long break and we're about ready to go back uh, for a little bit now. And so the positive thing is, we had we've had zero sicknesses um, within the band related to those rehearsals, or since we've had those rehearsals, nobody has had uh, any symptoms of COVID nineteen. So a few things I will mention that you know we're um, in a situation where we're not um, a hot spot right now. Um, where Franklin is, um, I will say that it's it's hard, and there's I don't think there's any necessarily right call in the situation that we're all facing with COVID-19 and that you do not want to put anyone in any sort of physical harm or physical danger. I mean, I have an eight month, eight month old daughter at home. I don't want her to get COVID-19. Um, and certainly I wouldn't want anyone of our students or family members to get it. Um, and we do have to consider our student social and emotional, emotional health, absolutely. I think the physical part outweighs that a little bit though, um, as far as my parts go. Um, I will say that we followed all county, um, all United States of America, like uh, health department um, and and CDC regulations for mitigation. So the way that it looked is we had um, um, a bunch of procedures and protocols in place, staggered entry times, staggered release times for everybody, kept everyone really, really far away from each other. Um, And I will say that we didn't play yet, and um, there will be more information out there for those of you who are band directors, on July 10th, there's a study in Colorado that kind of goes through how to mitigate some of these dangers um, with COVID-19 and wind players in particular, and what they suggest. And a lot of it will be for indoor playing. Um, so keep an eye out for that. And in a few days, just four days now, that's coming out. And I think a lot of us are, are kind of waiting, uh, holding our breaths to see what that looks like. Um, I will say, for, say that for now, it's, it's been incredible to see our students. Um, the huge benefit is that of student leadership and that we've been able to have some of our students create like an online visual manual. We're also working on um, an online music manual so that if we do go back to um, online teaching like we did in the spring, that we will have the resources at our disposal to educate our kids appropriately. And so they're still able to play. But for now, we're able to see them in person. We're able to get our instruments repaired so that they have working horns um, in case something happens where we have to go to a virtual setting again. Um, but I just want, did just want to throw that out there that um, there is a little bit of, of, of hope, although it's very, um, uh, I'm very, I'm very ca- cautiously optimistic about our chances to have band in the fall. That's good. You know, it, the performing arts community has clearly been absolutely ravaged during this time you know performers mm-hmm. losing gigs venues canceling seasons all the way till next calendar year and of course our public schools which already face these uh huge equity issues in yep. extremely yep. different ways in different places in the country are finding a way not only back to normalcy but uh trying to 
reevaluate and adjust what normalcy is. And I think, I think this pandemic has really caused us to, you know, especially uh, the educators who are looking for the longevity of their students and that education are, are really trying to think what is, what is the best thing for all? What is the best thing for our students? Do they need to come back? And so I, I think it's great that you're able to share some benefits with coming back with what a lot of the country would probably see as too soon. However, as you mentioned, you know, you're following state and federal guidelines and doing the distancing and everything like that. So I think that's awesome to see that the students are coming out with benefits right away from going back to rehearsals. Yeah. And I mean, who knows, who knows how long we're going to be able to do this. I mean, in the best case scenario, I mean, everything will go back to normal, but I, I just don't see that uh, is happening. I don't think any logical person really, um, or, or somebody who's, who's been, you know, following the news and who can kind of see where the, where the data is leading us. Um, I don't think anyone, anything is going to go back to, um, our old normal and what we're used to anytime soon. Um, but for now, without the rest of the school in session, we're at least able to spread out throughout the entire campus and, and make something work. Um, so that has been, that has been huge. And then the final slide here is I just, I just have more pictures and it's just to show a little bit of my life. You know, it's conferences with friends. Um, it's, it's zooming with, with, with people that you haven't seen in a long time and mm -hmm. everybody that you see on these pictures. I mean, I know them from the music world. Uh, some of my, my best friends um, come from the experiences that I've had with music and have, uh, my husband comes from that, <laughs> you know, our daughter comes from that. And so, I mean, without music, without being a performer and without being a teacher, I wouldn't um, have the life that I have now. So, wow, we got into a little bit of a real talk uh, earlier and saying that it is difficult. And I don't know if I'd want to push my daughter down this path. Um, I, I will say that I'm incredibly lucky and grateful um, to have the life that I have now. Well, that's awesome. That's so great to hear. You know, thank you so much for sharing all of this insight and wonderful information, you know, through your experiences, uh, you know, teaching and performing. Uh, I've, I've always felt like to be a teacher is to be a performer in some ways. And I, th I think it's really great to see how much you've truly embraced that lifestyle, but really it's not an act it comes from, you know, a very strong set of core values that you clearly demonstrate to your students and that grow with you as you grow as a human. I think that's one of the best ways that you can not only foster a great educational environment, but you're going to foster a great musical environment in creating music with new and familiar colleagues as well. Uh, Brianna, thank you so much. Uh, is there any advice you could give any of the young educators or young, young brass players, any, you, we got to give some love to our euphonium players out there. Any euphonium yes. specific things you want to throw out there? Um, yeah. Euphonium specific thing. Um, take care of your compensating valve. Uh, <laughs> no, I don't, I don't know if I have any uh, euphonium specific. I, I, I could get into pedagogy stuff, but that would be another hour long <laughs> conversation. Um, but I, I guess if there's um, one final piece of advice I could leave everybody with, it's to um, it's that if you have the choice between being if you have the choice between being kind or being right, <laughs> choose to be kind. <laughs> and that's not that's not saying to coddle everybody all the time, but if you have a choice where both of those things are presented to you, then then choose the kindness because not only is it the right thing to do, but it'll help you out in the long run. I and love it'll that. lead you to yeah, I mean it'll lead you to, to more things and greater things than you could you could ever imagine really. Awesome. Well, thank you all uh, very much for those of you who joined us live and those of you who are watching later to the third episode of our Bieber broadcast here in July. Uh, just another mention, uh, we mentioned Dr. Kenneth Johnson running some warm-up classes in the mornings. Uh, so be on the lookout for any of those graphics. We've got things going on every single day this week, including another Bieber premiere going on Friday. Uh, before we let everybody go, Brianna, uh, it is becoming a tradition here that we are going to have to ask you to sign off with your healthiest mouth trumpet noise. Those of you who just joined us or don't know what that is, it kind of sounds like a <gasps> kind of like that. So if you want to take it away whenever you're ready. Oh my gosh. Yes. Is there an award for this? Uh, well, like, can this be a contest? 
I, I I'm like just that. saying that. Um, hold on, hold on, one second. I got you. I got you. I, I will say that uh, having a daughter now, I have a lot of tools at mm -hmm. my disposal, and uh, I'll just grab one of them here. And also, I make so many noises um, to get my daughter's attention all the time. So, excuse me, one second. And then, and then, hold on, I get the, I get the Winnie from the horse in the sleigh ride. Hey, you, you need to watch out. You're going to take gigs away from trumpet players there. <laughs> uh, $9.99. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, once again, uh, this is uh, Mrs. Brianna Engelbert Vote sharing all the great information about being a teacher, a high school band director, and being a performer. Once again, on behalf of the entire Beva faculty, thank you so much for joining us during these podcasts, and I hope you all have a wonderful day. Bye. Thank you again to Brianna Engelberg Vogt for coming on today for episode three of Beva Broadcasts. Additionally, thank you to Tim Shade and Ben Morris for composing our intro and outro music. If you would like your product to be featured on our broadcasts, please reach out to me, Dakota Corbliss, Director of Operations, at dakota at fredbrass.com, and we'll be sure to set it up. Thank you all for listening, and see you next time.